We're closing out chapter 12 with catalysis. So there's your learning outcomes and expectations. Go ahead and pause and read through those. So yeah, 12.7, we're going to talk about catalysis. Now, the catalysis has as many casual definitions. You can catalyze a revolution and things like that. Uh, generally, conceptually, it's all the same, but in chemical kinetics, we have a very particular definition of catalysis, which is what we'll get into in this last section of chapter 12. And so we alluded to this uh, in the previous lecture in terms of experimental kinetics. There's a certain process you go through while studying chemical kinetics. You measure the rate of the reaction, formulate a rate law, possible reasonable mechanism, and design an experiment to uh, support the proposal. Here's another depiction of possible steps you can go through. You can vary concentrations, time, vary temperature. That gives you things like activation energy and rate laws associated with, or at least you propose a rate law. And from that rate law, you can propose a mechanism. And you can study your mechanism. You can uh, try to support that proposal by doing like uh, labeling or isolation experiments, try to find intermediates, try to observe them during it during temporary times. You can modify the structure where you think things are reacting. And you guys will talk more about these kinds of things in uh, organic chemistry. Uh, but for the sake of our class, we've done concentration uh, and temperature dependent measurements. We can figure out a rate law. We can figure out activation barriers. And ultimately, we want to do most of this stuff to understand the reaction to ultimately make it faster, cheaper, and more efficient, right? I mean, that's most of what we do in the sciences. We figure out how nature works and then bend it to our will to make it do what we want it to do, whether it's store energy or whether it's make a transformation that's good for drugs that we take on a daily basis. That's what we're trying to do. And so in terms, in the world of uh, kinetics and chemical reactivity, catalysis is the big way we do that. Like catalysis is how we make things faster, how we make uh, reactions happen that wouldn't happen otherwise. And so so here's the formal definition. Catalyst is a substance that increases the rate of chemical reaction without being consumed. And so it's involved in the reaction, but it's not a reactant. It is not a product. It, re it interacts with the reactants in some way to change how the reaction mechanism occurs, um, but it's not in the reactant or product. It just comes back to where it started. The main way it speeds up reactions is by lowering the activation barrier of a reaction. And so that's what catalyst is by definition, something that lowers the reaction barrier, but is not a reactant or product and it's not consumed during the reaction and it returns to its original state. And something to note when we talk about equilibrium in particular, it speeds up the forward and reverse reactions. And you'll see from our reaction coordinate diagram why that is the case. And so something to note about this as well is it doesn't change how much of the product you make. Right. I mean, it does. It changes how much you do with time. But if you have an infinite amount of time, you're always going to get the same amount of product. All the catalyst does is get you to that amount of product faster. And so that's why it's so useful in a lot of applications. And so here's our reaction coordinate diagram again. We have our reactants, we have our products, we have our delta E for the reaction, we have an activation barrier for forward and an activation barrier for the reverse process. We presumably have a transition state as well. Now that's an uncatalyzed reaction. If we add a catalyst to this and it speeds up the reaction, it's going to speed up the reaction by changing the path from A to B, right? Reactants and products say the same in both of these cases, but we're effectively changing the path it has to take to get there. And so again, the delta E overall reaction is the same. What's changing is the path between them. It changes the activation barrier and it lowers this EA from this to this, right? And that's really important. Remember from our Arrhenius equation, this activation barrier dictates our rate constant, which dictates the rate of the reaction. And so if we can lower this EA, we effectively make this number larger, which means we make the rate larger, right? Rate is equal to K times concentration of whatever. If K goes up, your rate of reaction goes up. And so by changing this EA, by lowering this activation barrier, we can speed up the reaction and we can get to these products faster. And so again, the way a catalyst works is it lowers that activation barrier by changing the mechanism. It doesn't go through the same transition state. It changes how those reactants react and how they come together. And so for a one-step reaction, um, you can have a one-step uh, reaction that's catalyzed. You'll change the activation barrier from this to this. You can also turn a one-step reaction into a multi-step reaction. And so here's an example of uncatalyzed. As soon as you catalyze it, you have a two-step process. The second step has the higher activation barrier. That'll dictate the rate of the reaction, you can have a three-step process. And so you're changing one step into say three-step process, but overall you've lowered the activation barrier. And so it's 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 
it's speeding up the reaction. So even if it takes more steps, it doesn't matter. As long as the overall hill is shorter, it will be faster with a catalyst. And so in terms of identifying catalysts, whether looking at the formula or experimentally, I mean, there's some rules. Catalyst is not consumed, right? It doesn't disappear over the course of the reaction. If it does, then it's a reactant. It, it's present at the start and the end. And so it's unchanged during that process. It's there before, it's thereafter. It's going to be there to do it over and over again. Uh, sometimes in kinetics, they use the term turnover number, where a catalyst can do the reaction many, many, many times because it's there at the start and there at the end. Uh, something to note in the form formulas, it does not show up in the overall reaction. It's there. It's, it's, it's like an intermediate species in the sense that it's involved, but it's not at the start and it's, uh, it's, it's not in the overall reaction. It's there at the start and there at the end, so it cancels out. And so looking at this reaction right here, H2O2 plus Br minus plus H plus going to H2O, H2O2, Br minus, and H plus, there's your reactants, there's your product, a two-step process that's catalyzed by one of these species. And so the way the catalyst shows up in this formula is basically we know it's not going to show up in the overall formula, much like an intermediate. The main difference is an intermediate is something that's generated and then consumed. A catalyst, on the other hand, is something you started with and something you end with in the end. And so you notice Br minus and H plus, they disappear, they're involved in the intermediates, but then they come back afterwards. And that's what it means to be a catalyst. It was there at the start, it was there at the end. But we cancel out everything on opposite sides of these arrows and the catalyst gets canceled out, the intermediate get canceled out. And so the overall reaction, reactants, products, you made an intermediate, it disappeared. You started with a catalyst, it disappeared, and then it came back. And so if you have these formulas, you can identify catalyst as a species that's there at the start, there at the end, but it's not, uh, it's not part of the overall equation because it cancels out on opposite sides. And so sometimes people just picked this um, not in the overall equation because this is still reactants and this is products. But if you have a catalyst, you might put it over the arrow like this. It basically says it's involved, but you're getting it back after the processing and it can do this over and over again. And so Br minus and H plus essentially go back, interact with H2O2, do this process over and over again. And so there's a couple of subcategories of catalysis. Uh, one of the main ones is homogeneous versus heterogeneous. And this is exactly what it sounds like. Homogeneous, they're in the same phase. Heterogeneous, they're in a different phase. And so homogeneous, um, typically this is going to occur in liquid or gas phase. And so like enzymatic catalysis, here's another example right here. Uh, it's O plus O3. Cl can act as a catalyst to convert those into O2. Uh, turns out this was a huge problem in the 60s and 70s. This is what made the ozone hole happen when people were putting fluorofluorocarbons in the atmosphere, it made Cl radicals that essentially did all sorts of destructive catalytic chemistry. And because it's a catalyst, it comes back and does it over and over again. Um, here's one we just showed, or like one we just showed in this case, I- minus can de decompose hydrogen peroxide. If you guys have ever seen the demo uh, like elephant toothpaste, this is basically what's happening. It's generating a whole bunch of O2 gas, and when you put soap in there, it makes bubbles really, really quickly. Heterogeneous catalysts, so, so homogeneous, all these were in the same phase. And so for the example of O2 and o, o, O3 and oxygen, all these are gas phase. And similarly for this one, all of them are in the liquid phase or aqueous phase. So they're all in solution together. Uh, heterogeneous catalysis, typically a solid and a liquid or a solid and a gas, you'll have a gas or a liquid interact with a solid. And so in this reaction, it's C2H4 on platinum. Platinum basically strips two hydrogens off this guy and gives off hydrogen gas, which is those red dots there, as well as this. And so this is the dehydrogenated process. And so you get rid of hydrogens during this. This is how you make dehydrogenated molecules. Here's another example, N2 plus H2 giving you NH3. Uh, this is actually the Haber-Bosch process. We'll talk about this more in equilibrium, but this one essentially you're combining N2 and H2, which are in the gas phase, on a solid surface, iron oxide, and it's giving you NH3 in the gas phase. And so this is heterogeneous because you have a gas interacting with solid, gas interacting with solid, liquid with solid, sol or gas with liquid. Those are all heterogeneous because they have different phases. And so enzymes is a special class of uh, catalysis and sometimes referred to as biocatalysis, but enzymes are proteins that uh, are catalysts, right? They, they take things and they lower the activation barrier and they speed up processes. And so this is an example of a homogeneous catalysis because typically it's in cells, it's in solution with the various different molecules. But what enzymes essentially do is they take 
whatever reaction is and they facilitate it. And so a lot of times this is referred to the lock and key mechanism where you have some particular protein structure and you have an active pocket and that active pocket has a very particular shape where say A and A can fit and they go in there and it, it lowers the barrier towards this reaction and then you kick out product B. And so it's, it's very selective, it's very specific at what it does, and typically enzymes speed up reactions a lot. And so it's millions of years of evolution and trial and error. The species that's better at doing this is going to have you know, energetic efficiency, is going to survive more. And so that's why catalysis is so important in biology. And so yeah, this is known as the lock and key mechanism, where there's a very particular shape. In contrast, when you look back at platinum, like it has a shape, but it doesn't have like this well-defined pocket that, say, an enzyme would. All right, so that's catalysis. Catalysis, we know it's a species that's at the start and at the end. It's involved in the reaction. It changes the activation barrier. It makes the reaction faster, but it's not consumed during the reaction. And so you can see that in the um, when you put the steps together. Is it at the start? Is it at the end? Is it used in between? Does it lower the activation barrier? Do you get it back after the reaction has occurred? Uh, catalysis can be homogeneous or heterogeneous subcategories. One of the big examples, especially in biology, is enzymes. Enzymes, these protein structures that are specific reactions, those are examples of homogeneous catalysis. So yeah, that closes out catalysis. Again, the narrative is you, you first you know, figure out how fast something happens, then you figure out why it's happening the way it is, and ultimately use catalysis to try to make it better or slow it down depending on what your goals are. If you're going to produce something on an industrial scale, you want catalysts to make product as fast and efficiently as possible. So it really comes down to understanding the nature of the problem and then troubleshooting it with adding catalysts to it. And that close out, closes out chapter 12 on chemical kinetics. Next, we'll start diving into chapter 13, which is equilibrium.